All right, so today, and in this, we are going to look at the respiratory system and our, um, the organs of respiration and breathing. So to start with, we're going to look at our half-head model, and this is going to show various structures. The first thing we're going to look at and is this entire area, which is called the nasal cavity. I think everybody knows what the nasal cavity is. We've all probably explored that at one point or another. Inside the nasal cavity, there is going to be three structures... And then each structure is going to have a little groove underneath it. And all of these are going to have names. Now, we looked at this in uh, 210 when we were studying the, uh, the skull inside. If we were looking straight in on the skull, and this is the nasal uh, cavity, we had these little wings that came off the side, that little bar in the middle is supposed to be the nasal septum, but we had these little wings and we learned them as what we called nasal concha. And in the, um, in the skeleton, you can only see two, but there's actually three. Uh, and so on this, you can see them. Um, they are called the superior concha, the middle concha, and the inferior concha. So number one is the superior concha. That's the one you can't see on the skeleton. Number two is the middle. And I always call it the nasal concha, the middle nasal concha. And number three is the uh, inferior nasal concha. Now, those are these little ridges. And I described them uh, or described them as little waves that have been kind of frozen. And what happens is they form this little area that's like a tube underneath them. And that tube is called a meatus. So everywhere there's a, a nasal concha, there is going to be this tube underneath it that we're going to call a meatus. And so the superior nasal concha has a superior nasal meatus underneath it. That's this little ridge underneath there. It's a little hollow opening. The middle nasal concha is going to have underneath it, in this little area here, what we call a middle nasal meatus. And then the inferior nasal concha is going to have the ridge called the inferior nasal meatus. Now again, you don't have to say nasal. I prefer it just because it reminds me of what I'm talking about. Now these, these structures are the perfect example of anatomy and physiology. Remember, anatomy is the study of what something looks like, where physiology is the study of what it does, uh, the function. And so the reason that they have this little wave-like curve here is that when the air is brought in through the nose, it's going to cause it to circulate, to form this little this little vortex, and it's going to make sure that all of the air we breathe in through our nasal cavity or through our nose is going to rub against the nasal mucosa and be filtered, which is a very good thing. So um, uh, we have no protections when we breathe through our mouth. There's nothing that, that filters the air as it comes through the mouth. And so in times like this, when we're worried about... Um, Infections, we really want to try to breathe through our nose as best as we can because that's going to help filter and catch anything. Um, and hopefully that will, as it does that, we, our body will fight it and get rid of it. Now this is simply a close-up picture of it. Uh, you can see the superior nasal concha with its superior nasal meatus. Uh, the middle nasal concha and this little ridge underneath it as the middle nasal meatus, uh, the inferior nasal concha and its little ridge underneath it as the inferior nasal meatus. Now, as the air comes in, it is going to go down a tube. Uh, this tube here, from all the way up top, all the way until it goes through this little fork in the road, this is called the pharynx. Now, the pharynx is subdivided, and that's what we're going to look at in the next slide. So the subdivisions, remember, this entire tube is called the, uh, the pharynx. So it's subdivided into the portion of the, 
the pharynx that's behind the nasal cavity is the nasal pharynx. The portion that's behind the oral cavity is the oropharynx. And then the part that's behind what we will eventually learn here in a second called the larynx will be called the laryngeopharynx. So there are three sections, uh, three subsections of the tube that we call the pharynx. Now, in just a second, we're going to look at this thing called the larynx. Now, the larynx, I want you to know, is an area. It is not a, it's not a structure. There's going to be some structures we're going to look at in the larynx, but the larynx is an area. When we put all of this stuff together, this is the picture um, from our, uh, that's also on the, the lab handout or the lab uh, PowerPoints. Um, this has the nasal concha. Uh, listed here, and then the nasal meatuses. There's a lot of stuff on this. I don't know that it's listed in the best possible order, but it's got the nasal pharynx, the oral pharynx, and the laryngeopharynx. These three areas of the pharynx. Uh, the one thing, the one other thing that I didn't kind of point out is at this area of the laryngeopharynx, there's like I said, is a it's kind of a fork in the road where things are going to make a decision. Um, if it goes through the anterior part, all right, so if it goes this way, it's going down to the respiratory system. That's what we're going to look at now. Um, if it goes this way, that's down the esophagus, down to the stomach, and that's the digestive system. Now, there is a special little flap of elastic cartilage called the epiglottis, right? This little guy right here. Um, it is what allows us to uh, swallow and not have things go down the wrong pipe. So if you've ever had something when you were eating or drinking and you swallow it down the wrong pipe, what happened is the epiglottis did not cover up the hole. Now, if the word is called epiglottis, Hopefully you should know that when I start talking about the, the entryway here, this little hole that's here, since this is the epiglottis, and epi means above, that you should know that the hole itself is going to be called the glottis. All right, so when we get to that, hopefully you'll uh, see that. Now, inside the area of the larynx, there are some really special structures. We call them our, our voice box. Now, in this set of pictures, there's only three things I want you to know. There's only three things that I am interested in you knowing. Uh, the, the first two are sets of skin folds. Now on this, the white skin fold right here that's on either side of this opening, these are called true vocal cords. All right. They are the ones that are going to vibrate and make noise. Now, as it shows right here, the true vocal cords can close uh, to cover up the passageway to the lungs, but it's going to change the shape of what I said was this opening here. Now, this opening is called the glottis. Now, this picture on this left side is an actual picture of uh, the uh, person and their uh, area that we'll call the voice box. So the opening here, this spot, is called the glottis, and so it is also this spot right here. Now, the true vocal cords on this picture are pretty easily seen. They're not white like in the drawing, but they're pretty, they stand out uh, pretty well on that. Now, the other part, the last part, are these skin folds that are on either side. So we're looking at on the drawings, these on either side here, and then on the picture, those right in here. All right, I'm going to erase some of this because I've got scribbling all over the place. Now, those um, skin folds on either side of the true vocal cords, the ones that are here and here, these are called false vocal cords. Uh, this is a pair, this is the false vocal cords on this picture. This is the false vocal cords on this picture. They're called false vocal cords because they do not make sound. They are, are simply there to help um, the true vocal cords and protect them. They're actually a little bit superior. They're above them. So if we're looking at it from the side, they would be uh, above or superior to the true vocal cords. Now, these two things, the, the voice box that we call the true and false vocal cords and the glottis, are going to be located in this area here. 
that area, this is specifically called the larynx. And I know we're going to have a picture with that on the next slide. But the area is the larynx. It is hard to write like this, but I think that that helps you. That is an area. The larynx is an area. And there's two structures we're going to look at that are in here. And they are the... Um, the one is called the thyroid cartilage, which I'm assuming that's number one, is the thyroid cartilage, which I'm assuming you should understand that there's going to be a gland associated with that called the thyroid gland. And then number two is called the cricoid cartilage. And that those two are the external structures that make up the area that we call the larynx. All right, so this kind of points out those two parts, the thyroid and the cricoid cartilage. Um, you don't have to know the thyroid gland here for this. We will talk about it in the endocrine system. And you don't have to know that this right here is the hyoid bone. But what I do want you to know is at the bottom of the area again that we call the larynx starts a tube that is called the trachea. And the trachea is another, is the scientific name for the windpipe. Now again, I will not take windpipe as an answer, but that is what the, <coughs> excuse me, what the, the regular world calls it. Now as the trachea comes down, it's going to divide um, because hopefully everybody's going to have a right and left lung. Now once it divides, they're going into each lung. Now what we want to understand is it's going to progressively divide and get smaller and change some of the structures in it. In lecture, you'll learn a little bit about the structural changes in it. In here, I'm simply worried about making sure you understand the divisions. So off of the trachea, there is going to be two what we call primary bronchi. And since this one's pointing to the one on the right side, this is saying it's the right primary bronchi. The area over here on the left is going to be this is the left primary bronchi, and I'll put a little line there where it stops. Wherever the primary bronchi uh, divides, so this one's going to have two here, this is now called the secondary bronchi or bronchus. Again, on the right side, we've got one here and one here, and actually there's another secondary bronchi behind here. On the right, there's going to be three, and on the left, there's going to be two. We'll find out why that is in just a second, because they go into the lobes, the individual lobes of the lung. Now, once it gets into the lobe of the lung, this secondary bronchi is going to branch a lot, and these are called tertiary bronchi. Now, um, there, you're going to learn that there's other names for those as you go through, and uh, lobar versus segmental as it goes in, but in here, in lab, I'm only worried about primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now, uh, hopefully that makes sense. There's only two primary as they go into each lung. As soon as they go into the lung, they'll divide to go into lobes. There's going to be three lobes on the right, so there's going to be three secondary uh, uh, bronchi on the right, and there's only going to be two lobes on the left, so there's going to be two secondary bronchi on the left. Then once they get in, they will branch uh, tremendously. And these are called tertiary or segmental. Again, I would tertiary is the, the name I would accept here. Um, but that's the way that the bronchial tree, as it's called, um, divides. Now this shows the, the area, uh, this whole stuff with the lungs attached. All right, So we've got the area called the larynx. I've got this, which is the thyroid cartilage, and then the smaller one here called the cricoid cartilage. Then I've got the area that's commonly called the windpipe, but we will call it the trachea. That's what I will take. I will not take windpipe. This has the same breakdown. You've got primary, right and left primary bronchi. Then you're going to have a right, three right secondary, and then two right or two left secondary and then a whole bunch of tertiary bronchi. Now, I would not uh, label this picture on those, um, or I don't plan to. Uh, we will use the model on that. The thing I want you to look at in this picture is when we start talking about the lungs. 
right? So I've got a right lung and a left lung. The right lung is going to have three lobes to it, where the left lung is only going to have two. And it's kind of like the heart. Inside the heart, the right AV valve has three flaps to it, so it's called the tricuspid. The left only has two, and it's called the bicuspid. So uh, in between each of these, there is going to be a fissure that we're going to learn. Now, if you look at it, the, the two that are here on the bottom, so uh, this one and this one, both run at angles, right? So they are called oblique fissures. So I've got a right and left oblique fissure. Now between the superior um, lobe and the middle lobe of the lung, of the right lung, I have this, which is a uh, unique fissure in the right lobe. And it runs basically across. Now remember in 210, we learned that Anything that runs across uh, that plane is called transverse or horizontal. And so this is called the horizontal fissure. And there's only one horizontal fissure, and it's on the right lobe or the right lung. Um, because e and so each lung is going to have an oblique fissure. So you will definitely have to put a right or left oblique fissure if it is labeled. I will let you get away without putting right horizontal fissure because there's only one. All right, so if you're labeling that, if you get it, if you name it right, that's the right thing. Now, uh, I did kind of skip over that the names of the lobes, you've got a superior, middle, and inferior lobe on the right-hand side, and then the left lung is only going to have a superior and inferior lobe. And then last but not least, we have what we call the diaphragm. Remember, the diaphragm is the main muscle of respiration. It is the muscle of normal breathing. And so that is what is going to pump or kind of change the volume of the thoracic cavity, bringing air in or pushing air out. This is another picture showing the different lobes or the lungs with their different lobes. Uh, superior lobe, inferior lobe, and then again, the, the right has a middle lobe. Same thing, kind of giving you a different view of it on one of the models. Uh, this is uh, fairly straightforward. Now we're looking at the inside of the trachea. Now, in 210, we learned that the respiratory system was lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium, as it says down here on the lower, uh, the lower right-hand side. So pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Remember that, and hopefully you'll remember that it is ciliated, which means that there is this little band of of little hair-like fibers on it that are trying to protect us. And it also has these things called goblet cells, right? These goblet cells that are embedded in there that are producing mucus. The last thing is just remember that any opening in the body is called a lumen. So uh, this, which is our windpipe or our trachea, this is the lumen. And so those are some of the things that would be on here. The one other thing that we didn't use to look at in, um, in 210 was the fact that the cartilage rings inside the trachea or along the trachea, so if you feel your throat, you've got all these little rings, they are called, or they are made up of hyaline cartilage. So that's what this is. This is all hyaline cartilage. Now, again, remember that uh, if you ever have a question about cartilage and you don't know, Guess Highland Cartilage. I'm not saying you'll be right, but you, the, the odds are on your favor. This is an actual picture that we have and used in 210 on the Grand Strand campus. And so this is a layer of pseudostratified columnar epithelium, the white little dots inside of it. And I'm sorry, I can't enlarge this right now. But those little white dots inside of it are the goblet cells. Uh, this area here is called the lumen. And then this little band here is highland cartilage. The last 
thing that we're going to look at is the microscopic view of the lungs. So these, uh, this is a cross section of the lungs. Uh, so we have first and foremost these little hollow openings that are the air sacs that we call a VLI. This is where the gas exchange happens. This is where the magic happens, where uh, oxygen is going to jump into our bloodstream and carbon dioxide is going to jump out of our bloodstream. The alveoli are made up of simple squamous epithelium. Now, endothelium is just saying because it's on the inside, but it's epithelium. Simple squamous epithelium. If you wrote endothelium, obviously it would still be correct. Right. So the alveoli, which are these little air sacs, are going to be made up of simple squamous cells. They are designed to give the minimum amount of protection uh, between the blood and, or separation between the blood and the air. All right. So that's, that is the, the makeup of these little alveoli. Now, there are a couple other structures in this picture that we didn't talk about in... Um, in 210. First and foremost is this thing that's going to be called an artery. Now I will tell you that if you just put blood vessel, this is going to be fine with me. I don't know how you can tell if it's an artery or a vein. I would put blood vessel, but that's just me. The way you can tell that it is, is the fact that it is going to have blood cells inside of it. If you have blood cells inside of some tube in the lung, it better be a blood vessel because if it's not, you've got problems. Right? So we've got blood coming into the area because obviously we need to get this blood to kind of run right by here so that the oxygen can jump into it and the carbon dioxide can jump out. Now, I also need to be bringing air into this area. So I have a bronchiole on this picture. Now, bronchioles are going to be, uh, a, you're able to tell bronchioles apart from the alveoli because bronchioles are going to have a much thicker wall and they're going to be more well-defined because of that. Um, I will tell you that this little structure right here um, is probably a bronchial because that is too thick of a wall all the way around to provide for gas exchange. If our, if our um, alveoli walls were that thick, it probably wouldn't work out well for us. Now, this, if I use this picture, this is the one that I would use since it's the one that's labeled. Now, this is a picture that we, this is a picture that we used in 210 here on this campus. And I'm just going to point out a few areas that are pretty, in my mind, pretty good examples, clear-cut examples of bronchioles first. So this would be my first pick as a bronchial. You can see that it's got a thick wall. Um, it is well structured. It is very uh, uh, normal in its uh, or regular in its uh, in its makeup. Uh, there's a smaller one right up here that you can see, and there's several of them in here. This little part here is going to be one too. Now those are bronchioles. Again, this one right here would be the one I would pick if I use this picture. Now, if I wanted to look at arterioles, the easiest one to see is this guy right there. Um, you can see that he is full of blood cells. There is another one up here. Whoop, that's a bad arrow, but you get the picture. Um, this one right here, you can see, again, full of blood cells. Uh, and that's what you would expect to see in a blood vessel. Now, if I was going to pick um, on a... Uh, a <laughs> a VLI, um, I would probably pick something like this one, or this one, or this one, and you can kind of see that they're irregularly shaped. They're going to have a much, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to have a much thinner wall, and that's so we can have gas exchange on those. So <clears throat> those are the microscopic pictures of the respiratory system.